Um, so we'll just start off by welcoming everybody for today's Sunday afternoon lecture. My name is Kate Zulo. I am the educator here at the Litchfield Historical Society. And this talk is part of our partnership with the League of Women Voters. Uh, this is a series of lectures that our two organizations have been partnering on. Um, I believe this is the fourth, um, the fourth lecture that we have done together. Um, and of course, these are wonderful opportunities to, um, to, to bring experts in the field um, to our community to share really timely topics, um, which is why we're really excited to have Alicia with us here today. Um, I just want to introduce my co-presenter, Lindsay, who is our representative from the League of Women Voters. Um, so Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to the Litchfield Historical Society for um, making this possible. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am a board member of the League of Women Voters of Litchfield County. I'd like to welcome you to our program this afternoon entitled Human Trafficking, a Victim Services Provider Perspective. The League of Women Voters is a political nonpartisan organization welcoming a diverse membership, regardless of gender, gender identity, or political perspective or affiliation. We study issues rather than supporting political parties, agendas, or candidates. The League has been recognized for its work in fostering civic engagement and education through forums like this. Our hope is that our efforts will help shape public policy, support needed legislation, and promote informed citizenship at all levels of government. This year, the League of Women Voters of Litchfield County decided to focus efforts in the area of education. In fulfilling that goal, we are co-sponsoring a virtual lecture series with our partner, the Litchfield Historical Society. Today's forum is the third of this series. For more information about our League of Women Voters chapter, upcoming events, or to become a member, please visit our website, litchfieldlwv.org, all lowercase. Thank you so much for attending this forum today. Our speaker today is Alicia Kinsman, an immigration attorney who provides te technical assistance and support for the legal immigration program at the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, also known as CIRI. Ms. Kinsman serves over 3,000 clients and their families each year. She also serves as staff attorney for Project Rescue, CIRI's anti-human tra trafficking program, and provides legal representation for immigration matter and in immigration matters to victims of human trafficking and other crimes. In 2013, she received an FBI field director's award for her work assisting medical professionals, law enforcement personnel, and social service providers to identify and work with foreign born trafficking victims. Before joining Siri, Ms. Kinsman earned her law degree from Quinnipiac University School of Law and co-founded their Human Rights Law Society. It is my great pleasure to introduce Alicia Kinsman. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lindsay and Kate, and to the Litchfield Historical Society and the League of Women Voters for hosting this event and inviting me to participate. Thank you so much. Um, so should we get started? Yes. All right, I'm going to share my screen so that you can um, see a PowerPoint that will sort of guide us on our way today. Um, again, my name is Alicia Kinsman. I um, am an attorney primarily working on immigration matters. And as Lindsay described, much of that work is, is with Siri. Um, Siri is a statewide nonprofit organization providing a variety of social and legal services to vulnerable immigrants and their families all across the state. Uh, we have offices in Hartford, in Stamford, Bridgeport, and Waterbury as well. 
Um, before I go much further into Siri and what we do really quickly, um, this is what I'm hoping to cover today in our time together uh, to talk a little bit about human trafficking, uh, what it is and what it looks like, at least in our experience at Siri uh, with our work here in the state of Connecticut. As part of that discussion, looking at the ways that we try to identify victims of human trafficking, which is really key to ensuring that we can protect the victims, but also um, ideally eradicate the crime altogether. Um, as a, an end goal of helping to ensure that more individuals across the state have an increased awareness of what human trafficking is, what it looks like, and probably most importantly, what resources exist for survivors so that they can begin to rebuild a life of dignity here in our state. Um, as Lindsay and Kate um, both said, uh, I am, um, you know, I welcome your questions. I would love to answer questions that you might have to really ensure that the information I'm sharing with you today is the information that will be most helpful to you and not just the information that I think is going to be the most helpful. So please do feel free to put questions in the chat box or in the Q&A, uh, the Q&A function, and um, I can be, you know, hopefully be able to answer all those questions and follow up with anybody as needed. But again, uh, back to, to Siri, um, we have been around for over 100 years doing really critical work here in our state. You can learn more about the work that we do, who we are, and any opportunities for volunteer and work. We have several positions open right now at Siri at our website, which is siriCT.org, C-I-R-I-C-T dot O-R-G. But back to the topic at hand. So today we're talking about human trafficking, right? And we're going to look at the federal definition and we're going to look at some case studies to see sort of how this has played out here in our state, where we found survivors, who the trafficking, who the traffickers are, what their trafficking situation looked like. Um, but it's important to note that, you know, there, you know, despite the multiple definitions that come from uh, federal legislation, state level legislation, international protocols and reports, we can boil all of that down to its most basic component. And so if we're looking at human trafficking and we're trying to define it in its most basic way, boiling it down to its most understandable pieces, it is forced or compelled work. It's a job where the employee uh, cannot stop working, cannot leave that job without suffering some kind of severe consequence. Even if that job is, and the employee, um, isn't a job or employee in the most formal sense. As we'll see, we've certainly seen trafficking in a, a more formal employment contexts like restaurants and uh, factories and farms, but we also see trafficking inside a home, right, inside of a private home through uh, domestic servitude or with sex work, right? So most boiled down to its most basic components, it's forced or coerced work where the employee, the person doing that work, providing that labor or those services cannot stop, cannot leave that job without suffering some kind of severe consequence. Traffickers will use force or fraud or coercion or a combination of, of many of those to in, attempt to compel their victims to provide that labor or services and or commercial sex acts against their will. As we'll see when we look at the federal definition of human trafficking, it's important to note that when it comes to sex trafficking, minor victims need not have been induced by force or fraud or coercion. Under the federal definition, an individual who is younger than age 18, who provides, who performs a commercial sex act is a victim of human trafficking. There need be no force, no fraud, nor coercion. Just those facts alone, age plus commercial sex act is sex trafficking, period, end of story, that's it. 
It is a rapidly growing crime. We have seen increased activity in Connecticut, but also globally. It is the fastest growing criminal enterprise globally. And that is for a lot of different reasons. We'll look at some of them in just a bit. But one of them is because it's a crime that often has a high potential for profit with relatively low risk. Now, if we were, um, as I hope we will be again someday soon together in a room, you know, I could ask you all to, to tell me, like, why do you think um, this is a crime that's historically seen as high profit and low risk? And I know many of you would be jumping in to share things like this, that when we're talking about trafficking, we're talking about uh, the abuse, the exploitation of a human being, right? And a human being can be used to provide services over and over and over again, and can be sold to someone else to be used and exploited over and over and over again, right? Making the potential for profit exponentially higher than say the illegal sale of drugs or the illegal sale of weapons. I promise you, I don't have any experience in either, but I do know that if you are selling drugs or you're selling guns, the transaction and the, the potential for profit is much limited, much more limited. Right? If you are going to be selling drugs or guns for a profit, you have to acquire those assets and then you sell them and the, the profit you make is the profit you're done with. Right? In order to make more money, you have to acquire more drugs or guns. When it comes to human beings, the potential for profit is exponentially higher. Right. And it's relatively low risk. We, the general public, service providers, and in particular law enforcement, we know what the illegal sale of drugs and guns look like. Right? We know what to look for. We know how to investigate those crimes. When it comes to human trafficking, the identification is incredibly difficult, as we'll see. Investigation is really difficult and prosecution probably the most difficult of all. That's for many reasons as well, in particular, that we're dealing with human beings, right? In the investigation and ideally successful prosecution of human trafficking, you're working with a human, right? A victim witness, someone who has survived something unbearable, who likely is terrified of coming forward, terrified of their trafficker, and most likely suffering from serious trauma which is going to impact their ability to cooperate in any meaningful way and may likely um, impede their ability to actually be a, um, a witness in an investigation or a prosecution. And so for all of those reasons and more, it's a lower risk crime for criminals, right? Because they know that they can target vulnerable individuals with a level of impunity. But uh, I'm a lawyer, lawyer hat on, let's look, let's look at the legal definition of trafficking, right? And so this definition comes from the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, which was enacted in 2000 and reauthorized many times since then as the Trafficking Victim, Re, uh, Trafficking Victim Protection Reauthorization Act, which is why it's abbreviated as TVPRA. The TVPRA delineates trafficking as being two types, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. But I would also point out again, that if we boil this down to its most basic components, it's the same thing, right? But for purposes of the statute, there are these two types, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is a commercial sex act that's induced by force or fraud or coercion or a commercial sex act performed by someone who has not yet attained 18 years of age. Again, a really important minor carve out, right? A 17 year old performing commercial sex is a victim of human trafficking, regardless of the presence of any force or fraud or coercion. And looking at this definition one more time, commercial is really important as well because commercial, a commercial sex act is not limited to sex for money, right? Commercial sex act would include sex in exchange or a sexual act in exchange for something of value. So that could be sex in exchange for food to eat, 
or a place to sleep or drugs or alcohol. That's sex trafficking, right? The second piece here is labor trafficking. Labor trafficking is defined by the recruitment or harboring or transportation or provision or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. Now there's a lot of clauses there, there's a lot of words, but just to break it down to make it a little more simple, there's some sort of action there, right? Recruitment or harboring or transportation, et cetera. You don't need all of those things. You don't need any one of those. You don't need any specific combination of those things. Um, anyone will do. And there, need to, there needs to be force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to slavery. Now, of course, the statute delineates this here as involuntary servitude or peonage or debt bondage or slavery. But for our purposes, since we're not prosecutors, we're not federal prosecutors, for our purposes, it all basically means slavery. There are nuances with peonage and debt bondage. For example, when it's the exchange of services in lieu of payment on a previous debt, but it all basically, at least for our purposes, means slavery. So that's the federal definition, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. This is a tool, this action means purpose um, uh, paradigm is a, is a tool, it's a device that folks use to attempt to better understand how this works, right? It breaks down the federal statute into these three pieces. And because you need one of these, each one, each of these three pieces for us to get to human trafficking. Right, so there's an action, there's inducement, recruitment, harboring, or transportation, or providing, or obtaining, or patronizing, or solicitation of uh, an act. And then there's a means, right? There's force, or there's fraud, or coercion, unless it's a minor for commercial sex. And then there's a purpose, there's an end, right? There's a reason why this exploitation has occurred, and it's for the purpose of either commercial sex, sex trafficking, or labor trafficking. Now, there are many um, commonly held misconceptions when it comes to human trafficking and what it looks like and what it means. Um, one of the more common ones I hear, and honestly, it's one that I held prior to working in this field, is that in order for it to be trafficking, there needs to be some sort of movement, right? That there, and more than that, that there is some sort of border crossing, right? Um, you hear folks uh, talking about someone being trafficked into the United States or trafficked in, you know, from um, Eastern Europe, right? That the, um, implying that there needs to be transportation or movement for, or a border crossing, a facilitated border crossing for us to um, define it as human trafficking. And as we just saw in the federal definition, that's not the case, right? Transportation may be an element, but human trafficking can occur solely in one home, right? With, with neither the victim nor the trafficker ever having stepped foot outside or within one city block, one state, one country, right? Um, Transportation is not the only action that can be part of human trafficking, obtaining, providing, harboring, et cetera. But there is this misconception that leads to um, conflating the ideas of human trafficking and human smuggling. Right? So um, smuggling, right? Human smuggling is a separate offense, right? Human smuggling is often the facilitated illegal entry of a person from one country into another, right? So if we're talking about smuggling along the Canadian border with Canada, right? And a, a smuggler um, facilitating an individual not authorized to come to the United States to enter the US without permission, right? A facilitated unlawful entry into another country. It's an offense against 
the um, integrity of U.S. borders. It's a civil immigration offense. It typically is voluntary. The individual contracting with the smuggler to assist him or her to attempt to make this unlawful entry into another country. And when we look at the, um, the federal crime of alien smuggling or the civil immigration offense of smuggling or facilitated unlawful entries, um, the individuals themselves, the smuggled persons are seen as criminals or in violation of the law. Okay. On the other hand, when we're talking about human trafficking, we're talking about force, fraud, or coercion, compelling labor services or commercial sex. Right? It is a crime against another human being. It's a violation of the rights of another human being and individuals who are the victim of trafficking are victims under the law. Now, where some of this confusion comes is in the overlap because it is common for us to see individuals who have been smuggled become victims of human trafficking. And the way that it happens is often like this. An individual, for example, a past client of mine who was fleeing a domestic violence situation in her home country with her two small children, was desperate to come to the United States to other families she had here to save her life and the lives of her children. She paid a smuggler in Mexico to facilitate an attempted unlawful entry into the US, right? She didn't have lawful permission to come to the US. She paid someone to try to smuggle herself and her two minor children into the US. That is smuggling. It was a voluntary act. She paid a fee for a facilitated unlawful entry and in doing so was in violation of um, immigration provisions. However, once she arrived in the United States, the individuals who smuggled her said, okay, we got here successfully. Unfortunately, now you owe us another fee, right? Yeah, you paid $5,000 to come here, but we got here successfully. And so surprise, there's another $5,000 fee. And oh, you don't have $5,000 on you. Well, then you're going to have to stay here in a literally locked house um, until you can pay off that debt. And the way that um, they were forced to pay off that debt was by providing labor or services under conditions of slavery. In that case, individuals who were smuggled then became victims of human trafficking. They were exploited, they were already vulnerable, their lives were really basically in the hands of their smuggler, who um, were the only individuals who knew the way to the United States through the desert that's over 100 degrees at night, where there's wildlife, and where there are gangs and other um, uh, serious threats to health and safety. And who once here took advantage of that power, took advantage of their power, uh, of that um, in unequal power dynamic to exploit them in an ongoing way upon arrival into the US. So trafficking and smuggling, two different offenses with two different goals. However, individuals who are smuggled are vulnerable to exploitation and sometimes that exploitation may rise to the level of human trafficking if there is compelled force, um, compelled or forced work or services. So that is what trafficking, uh, that is, the, those are some of the definitions of human trafficking. Um, where does it happen, right? Where are we seeing cases of human trafficking? Well, here in Connecticut, in terms of sex trafficking, we've seen cases um, certainly in street level prostitution, though the age of the internet and a pandemic has moved most of that online uh, to online services. Um, exploitation of individuals, including minors online, uh, sex trafficking in the production of pornography, in massage parlors, in brothels, informal brothels, um, in forced marriage and servile marriage, uh, in child marriage, and abroad in child sex tourism. In terms of labor trafficking, 
Um, you've seen it in agricultural industry. Now up in Litchfield, you probably are more familiar with the agricultural industry in Connecticut. Um, you know, myself being uh, born and raised in Bridgeport, it's, you know, it's um, crazy to think of the differences and what our landscape looks like and what our cities and towns look like. You know, if you had told me about um, large farms and uh, uh, agricultural industry in, in Connecticut as a, as a child or teenager, I probably wouldn't believe you, um, but there is, there are, you know, um, farms and there are agricultural industries throughout the state um, that often use labor, sometimes migrant labor, sometimes non-immigrant workers. Um, and we have seen in some cases there um, be exploitation that, in many cases, exploitation, and in some cases, exploitation that rises to the level of human trafficking. Um, also in restaurants, in ho the hotel and hospitality industry, in nail salons and hair salons, hair braiding salons, in factories, and also in domestic work. Individuals providing nanny services, providing housekeeping, cleaning services, landscaping services, etc. inside of private homes. Okay, so we, we now are experts in what human trafficking is and where it might occur. Um, so why, right? Like why, why now? Why are we talking about human trafficking? Um, and why is it a crime that, it, that continues to grow, especially now in a time where it is illegal globally, right? There are more individuals um, enslaved today than at any other point in human history. And now you might tell me, okay, Alicia, uh, granted, maybe there's more people enslaved today than at any other point in human history, but we also have more people today than at any other point in human history, among other factors, which is true. But today, which is much different than 20 years ago, 100 years ago, et cetera, um, we have the tools, we have the laws. Uh, human trafficking is illegal in every country of the United States, right? And so if that's the case, if we have these tools, if we have these important laws to attempt to prevent the crime and protect victims and prosecute the traffickers, why? Why does it continue to happen? Well, there are, and again, if we were all together, I'm sure you would be sharing with me, you know, your perspective, perspective of some of the root causes um, and there are many, and, and no, single, no single factor has been determinative of, of its growth. Um, but some of the factors, some of these root causes are um, systemic injustice, right? Systems that have been built to protect a few and that leave out many, right? Uh, systemic injustice when it comes to racism, when it comes to xenophobia, um, among uh, you know our immigration laws, for example, which have a very racist uh, history and continue to have elements and um, processes that are based on those racist origins that leave out many individuals and make them vulnerable to exploitation. Um, also, you know, criminality, individuals who are criminals who are making bad choices and seeking profit are looking to sell human beings for some of the reasons that I discussed at the beginning when we were talking about the fact that it's a relatively low risk crime with a high potential for profit. Um, and, and again, our immigration system and also many of the other different systems that serve vulnerable populations like youth, like you LGBTQIA youth, um, homeless youth, for example, um, very often um, are uh, not meeting the needs of those individuals and can result in those individuals running away or um, otherwise falling into the hands of individuals who, of those who um, are exploiting them. A lot of the work that I do at Siri, because it's an organization that has a long history of working with the foreign born population, the majority of the victims I work with are foreign born. Now, victims of trafficking can be foreign born and domestic, green card holding, asylum seekers, undocumented, everywhere in between. 
But because our program, our legal immigration program, sees so many individuals who are foreign born and undocumented, that tends to be uh, that um, those individuals tend to make up the larger percentage of the of the clients that we work with. And so these are individuals who have, in many cases, fled their home country, have been pushed from their home country for factors such as serious trauma in their home country, um, uh, serious poverty and starvation, corrupt government, corrupt law enforcement, gang warfare, forced gang recruitment, uh, serious violence, domestic violence, sexual violence, etc and others who are also um, pulled to the United States experience these pull factors um, because they're seeking a better life, because they are attempting to provide for their children, just provide basic nutrition for their children, afford food for them, uh, afford to send them to school, um, and are desperate to exit their impoverished situation or exit their um, uh, the difficult situation they're in to give themselves and their family members a better life. We'll look at, um, and we look at a case study in a second, uh, we'll illustrate a little bit of how this, how this plays out. Who are the traffickers? Who are the individuals involved in human trafficking? Right? There are lots of stereotypes that come from movies and the media um, and, you know, social media now more than ever that victims fall prey because they're kidnapped out of Target parking lots because of a dollar bill left under their windshield wiper, right? Or they're snatched off the street from gang members, um, or that there's always that sort of violent piece to it. Um, and certainly cases like that have happened, but in my experience, they tend to be the outliers, right? The reality of what we see more often are individuals that are trafficked by people close to them, right? By people they trust. And it's that trust that made them vulnerable, right? Trafficked by family members, by relatives, um, by partners, by their spouse, um, by members of their community, um, by their friends, their peers, or and or their employers. The survivors themselves, you know, we also, um, you know, tend to look at survivors of trafficking as being this sort of like unknown, um, this unknown known group of people of injured, bruised women, um, sex workers, immigrants, and certainly they are, but they're here, right? These are our friends. These are our neighbors, our community members, right? These are individuals, children and adults of every age and race, of every gender identity, both foreign born and US born, um, who have been exploited because of some vulnerability. And where that vulnerability came from may be very different if we're talking about a um, um, substance dependent US born uh, minor versus a foreign born adult male versus a foreign born um, minor female, right? There's a vulnerability that's exploited and that vulnerability is going to differ, differ from person to person. Um, I'm going to, just for purposes of time, I'm going to um, move a little bit more quickly through some of these slides because I talked about most of this already um, and a little it's a little bit repetitive and I just want to make sure that we get to the key studies as well. Um, I'm going to go here. So um, as I mentioned, identification has historically been a significant challenge for service providers and law enforcement alike because in many cases the crime of human trafficking is something that's happening right in front of us and we don't know it, we don't realize it, right? And it, it makes sense, right? If we're talking about a foreign born adult woman, right? One of my cases, a 70 year old Lithuanian woman working inside of a home in Norwalk, Connecticut, who is timid and shy, who doesn't wanna to talk to anybody who comes to the door, who doesn't speak English, who is cowering in the corner and hiding anytime the police drive by, right? That individual looks like a housekeeper or a nanny who maybe is undocumented and so really afraid of any kind of law enforcement and doesn't speak English, 
right? And you, you're not going to see that she was has been held in that home for seven years, working every single day, cooking and cleaning and caring for children and adult family members for no pay and provided very little food and zero medical care and also threatened verbally abused and in some occasions physically abused, right? If you are seeing a 17 year old, right? Posted online, a 17 year old inside of a motel providing commercial sex acts to you or I, to law enforcement at first glance, she might look like a criminal, right? Not necessarily going to present or even act like a victim of some serious crime. And so with all these factors that make it so difficult to identify, um, we have to look for red flags, right? Look for, look for something. Um, no one of these red flags or indicators is going to um, uh, uh, you know, determine that we have a survivor of trafficking, right? But it's a trigger to ask another question, right? A trigger to make a call, right? Get more information, ask more, connect this person with resources. Right? Those would include uh, an individual who um, is being threatened about their immigration status, who is not being paid at work, who is working under abusive circumstances, um, who is, you know, a, a, some, an individual who's under 18 who's working, who has mysterious, um, mysteriously appearing uh, money or um, clothing or jewelry, who has um, uh, uh, no good explanation for absences. Um, indicators would also include, um, you know, general signs of trauma and, um, and in intimidation and anxiety. And certainly when we're talking about youth and uh, including domestic, domestic US born youth, uh, homelessness or uh, chronic homelessness or uh, frequent, frequent runaways from, especially from concrete care settings, um, those are individuals who are going to be particularly vulnerable to exploitation. Does it mean that a youth who is frequently running away uh, or going AWOL from a foster care or a congregate care setting is a victim of trafficking? No, right? It does mean that they're really vulnerable to exploitation. And in some cases, that exploitation may rise to the level of human trafficking. All right. Um, so I want to quickly go through these two case studies, but I think that they are they paint um, sort of the um, the wide range of cases that the, the the variation in which trafficking can present itself. Okay, so this first one here, um, this is the case of Corey Davis, who was a human trafficker. He was a pimp working in the Bridgeport area, but also had property and establishments in New York and in Florida. Um, he was, um, had at any given point, uh, 20 or more girls and young women that he was forcing to work for him, forcing to provide commercial sex uh, for his financial benefit. His victims were as young as 12 years old, uh, 12 years old, 17 years old, um, as well as other women in their 20s and younger 30s, some of whom started working as young as 12 and 13 years of age. He um, forced these women to provide up to 12 hours a night of commercial sex acts, which resulted, as you can imagine, in him becoming incredibly wealthy. Um, he was uh, horrifically physically violent um, and so violent that it was uh, actually um, the physical abuse of the 12 year old girl that led to his arrest because he injured her so badly one night when she didn't meet her quota, the amount of money she was expected to make, um, that she had to seek medical attention. And when she went to the hospital and the doctors and the nurses there saw that um, this was a young woman who was not with her parents, um, and who at, at a um, very late at night with suspicious injuries, it was the nurses, right? The ER nurses that had um, that foresight and that intuition to call DCF. 
and to get others involved to see what was going on here. And um, through a, a joint investigation that included Bridgeport PD, NYPD, Florida um, uh, State Police and the FBI, he was arrested and sentenced to 25 years in federal prison and forced to pay restitution to all of his victims. That's on one side of the spectrum, right? I, um, uh, an individual uh, sex trafficking victims, primarily US born, primarily females, uh, ages 12 to uh, um, 30s. On the other side of the spectrum here is this other case that happened here in Connecticut, a case of labor trafficking of adult foreign born males. This was uh, a case that occurred in Granby, Connecticut where a farm recruited 12 Guatemalan men to come to the United States through a lawful immigration program, a non-immigrant worker program that allows certain employers to bring foreign born workers into the country to work some seasonal, uh, to work a growing season or some other period of time where there's the seasonal need for increased employment. When the, and the men were promised you know, the prevailing wage, you have to pay your employees the prevailing wage when you use a worker program like this and on farm housing and food and medical care. And so for many of these individuals, it was a dream come true. They would be able to make enough money that they basically wouldn't have to work the rest of the year just working six months in the United States um, and being able to send all of that money home to their family because while they were here, they'd be provided with food and medical care as needed. The reality was that the men were picked up from the airport, driven to Granby, their passports were confiscated. Um, they were living in horrific um, barrack style uh, housing with inadequate uh, toilet and shower, uh, toilets and showers. They were working um, under horrible um, circumstances, forced to work uh, 80 hour work weeks Many of them, because of the work and the unsanitary conditions, became extremely ill. And so because once someone got ill, living in really tight quarters, they all became seriously ill, but were threatened uh, with their immigration status and threatened with physical harm if they didn't continue working. They were paid, but the um, farm owners uh, deducted from their paychecks all of these miscellaneous fees for housing and medical care that they never received. Um, and immigration fees that they didn't actually pay to the point that their weekly paychecks would be for something like $1.99, $3, $7. Um, and so they were making, they made almost no money um, despite their promises. The good news here is that the, um, the members of that community, uh, when these men went to church, uh, members of that um, of that church community saw them, you know, recognize uh, they were easy to to spot given that they were 12 Guatemalan men in Granby, Connecticut, and were eventually able to figure out that what was happening wasn't right and were able to link them with um, law enforcement and eventually um, uh, social services to ensure that they could become healthy and um, you know, for some go back to their home country, for others obtain legal relief here in the U.S. and reunite with their families here. Um, I worked with these men and this was from several years ago and um, they all, all of those individuals who chose to stay in the U.S. Um, well, one, uh, have become U.S. citizens. There's one who's applying right now. All right, so um, before we wrap up, I wanna, or before we not wrap up, but rather I wrap up so that I can get to your questions, I wanna quickly um, talk about unaccompanied alien children um, because this is a subset of foreign born individuals who are particularly vulnerable to trafficking. These are children under the age of 18 who don't have lawful status here in the US but are encountered by US immigration officials and detained and put into removal proceedings. Um, these young children are particularly vulnerable because very often they've come from traumatic situations in their home country and that's what led them to flee. And in other instances, once they arrive, they are increasingly vulnerable to exploitation because they are languishing in an immigration system that often will take many years for them to resolve their case. That resolution may in fact be deportation back to their home country in many cases. 
and during that time often aren't able to access resources or services or support that's needed and so they are often not going to school and um, and falling prey to individuals who exploit them. Um, there is a really great frontline documentary that you can watch um, at pbs.org called Trafficked in America that follows the story of several young boys, teens, young men who were trafficked in Marion, Marion Ohio. They were unaccompanied alien children um, who were exploited for labor on a chicken farm. It's a really well done and powerful documentary that I um, highly recommend. All right, I want to make sure that we have time for your questions. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to leave my slide deck on the last slide, which has my contact information in case um, that's helpful. I'm very happy to share the slide deck with whomever it makes sense. If there's folks that would like it, um, you know, to go through the information that I wasn't able to get to today or that I went through too quickly. But um, with that being said, does anybody have questions? Okay, um, we got a question um, uh, about the availability of safe houses in Connecticut. Um, you mean um, mm -hmm. So there are shelters in Connecticut that provide um, shelter, emergency shelter and housing for survivors of human trafficking. Um, there are also specific housing programs. Siri partners with um, housing on a, a rapid rehousing program that's specifically for survivors of human trafficking. There are also some organizations that have uh, trafficking specific uh, longer term shelter programs. Um, so yes, <laughs> the short answer is yes. All right, so Lindsay, you are muted. Um, but you know, it does look like we have a couple, oh, there you go. Nope, you did again. I see two questions in the Q and A that I gave Yeah, should, so we'll should we ask these questions from Doreen who wants to know, um, and I actually was wondering this as well. Sure. You know, I was wondering what happens um, to victims after, you know, after they end up with, as your clients, um, you know, Doreen wants to know if they qualify for asylum, but maybe you could speak more broadly about you yeah. know, what the path is for some of these people who do survive. Sure. Yeah, so it, it's going to depend on the case. There are forms of immigration relief that were designed to assist foreign-born victims of serious crimes. Um, for example, the U visa is a form of immigration relief that may be available to certain individuals who've been the victim of human trafficking, but also several other crimes who have assisted in the investigation or prosecution of that crime and have suffered some kind of significant harm as a result of their victimization that could be physical or emotional or both. The T visa is another form of relief that is specifically for human trafficking. Certain survivors of trafficking may be able to apply for the T visa, but the victimization alone isn't enough. To be eligible for a T visa, you have to have been the victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons. You also have to be physically present in the United States on account of the trafficking, which has this twisted um, case law history that makes it really difficult for many survivors to obtain this form of relief if they were trafficked sometime in the past and didn't immediately come forward and report the crime, um, which can be a really common response. If someone is traumatic and they've just gone into survival mode, their first thought is not going to be, let me go report this thing, right? It's let me survive, let me figure out how to move forward. Um, so there are other elements that can make it really difficult. Both the U visa and the T visa are also quote, quota based. There's only 10,000 U visas available each year, only 5,000 T visas available each fiscal year, which can also create significant wait times, even for the individuals who are eligible for them. For the U visa, for example, the U.S. Immigration, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service right now is approving approvable cases that were filed in March of 2016. That means that those victims have been waiting five years and victims that apply today are just going to be waiting even longer and maybe as long as 10 years 
before they actually get any legal protection here in the US. There may be some survivors eligible for asylum, but asylum has completely different requirements. Asylum is uh, maybe available to someone who's been persecuted on account of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So there may be victims <coughs> trafficking who were also persecuted in their home country, and maybe that's part of their vulnerability. For example, if they were part of the, if they um, identified as LGBTQIA or similar. There may be some ties, um, but um, the you know not all survivors of trafficking want to stay in the U.S. Some may decide they want to go back to their home country. Those that do want in, to stay in the United States are not guaranteed immigration protection. Unfortunately, um, it is quite a difficult um, a quite a difficult endeavor. And under the previous administration, it was a really risky one because denial of a T visa application would result in that individual being put into removal proceedings. So basically, if you asked for help because of your victimization and your case was denied, even if it was for a technical you know, evidentiary reason, even if it was because of the government's mistake, because they do make mistakes, you were then put into removal proceedings and potentially ordered deported. So a really challenge, right? That's why the work that Siri does, um, in my opinion, is so critical because for many of our survivors who are foreign born, their immigration status is one of their, their most paramount concerns um, because for many of them, they left their home country running, right? So the idea of deportation is not just this inconvenience of being sent home, it's life or death, right? That they're going to be sent back to the place where they left running. All right. There's um, another question from Doreen um, about uh, Siri's work with UACs. So um, the question is, does Siri place UACs in Connecticut? So we, we don't have control over the placement of unaccompanied alien children. Unaccompanied alien children who come to Connecticut may be working with Siri in a variety of different ways. Um, any unaccompanied alien child or any immigrant who's in Connecticut who needs legal representation in their immigration matter may be contacting our legal team to assist in their case. We also provide specific legal representation and legal services to UACs detained in a specific shelter here in Connecticut. Um, so that's really specific contracted work for detained minors. Um, and then we have a, another part of our program provides on the social services side, um, home study and post-release services. So those are certain individuals assigned to us who have been um, released to a sponsor or parent or caregiver in the state of Connecticut. And so our team is helping to ensure that that is an appropriate space for them to be, that they're connected with resources, that they know about their immigration case, that they're enrolled in school, that they're safe and secure um, and are moving forward in their, in their case. So we do a lot of work with UACs, um, but we don't control the, the process. We're a provider. I have a question, um, which is uh, has to do with um, what penalties the traffickers um, face, and um, including if if there are jail terms, um, are they mandatory, and how long are they? So, the, so it really depends, and that's going to be a little outside of my wheelhouse, um, since I'm not a prosecutor and I'm working on the, um, the, you know, the victim side with mostly with immigration matters. Um, but it really is going to depend on whether there is actually a prosecution. There are many cases that don't end up going forward to prosecution for lots of reasons, including that you know, in many cases, the victim um, is not able to report what happened or is not able to testify to what happened in a credible way because of the trauma that he or she is still suffering from, or there isn't sufficient evidence to actually bring forward a prosecution. Um, and uh, it also, if the case is prosecuted, it's going to depend on um, what statute is used, whether it's federal statute, the Federal Trafficking Victim Protection Act or something else, or whether it is a state, a state law, right? Um, trafficking is also a class B felony in the state of Connecticut. 
Um, uh, a prosecutor may be bringing a, a different charge for a variety of reasons based on the evidence they have in front of them and strategy and everything else that goes into that really, really hard work. Um, I know that there, for the federal, on the federal side, I think the federal, um, the, the um, maximum is 25 years or either 20 or 25 years for conviction of um, human trafficking, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, and uh, in terms of um, criminality, the victims of sex trafficking, at one point, um, are they identified as not being um, subject to pr criminal prosecution themselves? Yeah, that's a really, it's a great question. And it really is going to depend about when and where we're talking about, right? Um, here in the state of Connecticut, we have come a long way in terms of our um, legislation and how we protect victims and prosecute the perpetrators. There's still work to be done. And there's currently a, um, a piece of legislation on vacators that would allow um, survivors of human trafficking who have been convicted of crimes related to the trafficking can have those convictions vacated because they were victims of trafficking, right? So, you know, things like prostitution convictions and other convictions that would have been related to their victimization. Um, in the state of Connecticut, uh, our statute has been modified a variety, of, uh, a, a handful of times to bring it more in line with the federal statute so that if we have a 17 year old providing commercial sex, he or she is not a prostitute, can't be, it's a, it is a legal impossibility um, so that he or she is not arrested or convicted of a crime like that. And if they have been arrested in the past, that they have an affirmative defense or uh, the ability to vacate that, that conviction. Is that just in Connecticut? Is that something that's state yes. by state or? It's state by state, right? That, so the federal law is clear, but each state has its own laws when it comes. And there are some states where an individual under the age of 18 can be arrested for prostitution, even though under the federal laws, um, he or she would be a victim of, of human trafficking. Um, that we still, our state still has a way to go, but we have um, made some positive changes and the current vacator, uh, leg vacator legislation would be uh, an additional significant step. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the great work that the Department of Children and Families does here in the state of Connecticut, um, which who are DCF is uh, now statutorily authorized, mandated to provide care and services to minor victims of human trafficking. And so they have a specific um, care line for law enforcement so that if law enforcement encounters someone who is confirmed or high risk or suspected of being the victim of trafficking, um, they can call that in so that DCF can ensure that they're receiving the care and services that they need. What about victims who are older, who are over 18 or 21? Well, right. Um, at what point are they identified as being victims and not criminals? Yeah, so it's really going to depend on, on the facts of the case and how that client is, uh, how that individual um, is encountered. You know, I, I will say that, you know, we have, we work with law enforcement partners here in the state who, you know, we do training. I'm going to be at the um, Milford Police Department next week. Um, many of the major police departments do extensive training on how to identify human trafficking victims, what to do if they do encounter um, a victim, which would not include arrest, right, but rather referral for services, ensuring that that individual can access the resources that might be available to them. And it's, it's you know, it is a, that's a mutually beneficial thing, right, because law enforcement's job is more difficult if victims are being exploited and then arrested, right? That makes us all less safe because the bad guys are, might be getting, are getting away, right? And so um, that also ensures that we can be um, protecting victims and uh, ensuring that we are prosecuting uh, the perpetrators with, with a goal of um, stopping this from happening. Okay. So I, that kind of led me to a question I had, um, the, I, the fact that you're, you know, going and talking um, and, and teaching people about how to spot human trafficking and 
think this also kind of ties in Rosemary's question about how we can advocate with legislators. But you know, for for our audience who are um, you know just the general public, what you know, what would you recommend? How how can we you know help in in this? Um, yeah. So awareness is key, right? Knowing what this is, knowing what it's not is really important, right? Um, and also, you know, um, using the existing hotlines and tip lines to report um, when you see something that looks off. Um, I can't tell you how many people that I have worked with and spoke with who said, you know, like I went to this place or I went to this restaurant and I saw that the, you know, their employees were sleeping in the back and they looked really um, malnourished and I just didn't know what to do or if, if it made sense to call a tip line, you know, what if it's nothing? And what if it's nothing? But what if it's something, right? And what if, you know, law enforcement has received two or three calls, but it's not enough yet. And it's the fourth call, right? It's the fifth call that's going to be enough for them to drive by and take a look. And so there are many different tip lines and hotlines where individuals can leave as much or as little identifying information as they want. It can be completely anonymous. Um, to provide information. And then that means that you're giving the information to the people whose job it is to investigate because it's not our job to investigate trafficking, right? If you call me and you say, I think there's trafficking here, I'm going to direct you to the people that can do something with that information. You or I, unless we have law enforcement, uh, uh, <laughs> right, right. that's not our job. But what we can do is try to ensure that that information gets to the hands of people whose job it is, who's, who are professionals, who are trained and equipped to do that. Um, so in the PowerPoint, I'll, I can just share this again really quick, but um, I have a couple of the um, tip lines here. Um, the National Anti-Trafficking uh, Resource Center hotline, which is run by the Polaris Project, is a national 24-7 multilingual hotline. Uh, that's 888-373-7888. And you can, any individual can call, a victim can call, you can text help to that number as well. If you are um, a victim who is need, needing services or assistance, and they will ensure that the information gets to the law enforcement partners or social service partners in the state where the victim is located. For Connecticut specific, there's also a, the state police have a um, have a, a, a tip line for reports like this as part of their organized crime task force task force unit, um, and then the Department of Justice also has a trafficking in persons tip line. So any and all of these are great. Um, things to have on hand. DCF's Caroline also, um, you know, if DCF receives a report of an individual, a minor who is suspected of or high risk of becoming a survivor of human trafficking, um, that would go to the DCF Caroline. Mm 